towards the beginning of Jonathan Glazer's The Zone of Interest, we see family man and Nazi commandant Rudolf Haas leave his house and enter the Auschwitz camp right next to it, before our camera urgently cuts to another angle where the camps can't be seen anymore. His wife can now be seen showing her daughter up close the beautiful flowers that form a part of their garden. Later on in the story, it's no coincidence that when Hedwig shows off her garden to her mother, while we hear shrieks and explosions from the camps, the camera immediately cuts to several close-ups of the flowers, as if like the child, even we are being told to look at the flowers instead of the destruction happening in the background. The Zone of Interest presents its viewers with a unique opportunity. In an era filled with films either focusing on Hitler's political power or the terrible conditions meted out to his 6 million victims, this film tells us about how regular people who formed the majority of the Nazi German state lived their lives right next to this evil to focus instead on their pretty gardens. For this reason, the film deliberately shuts us away from the macropolitics of the Nazi state and arrests its gaze on the micropolitics of a family who have been promised the dream of a strong, healthy and happy life. In this video, I'd like to look into how the film's dive into the private life of this household happens to reveal the core tragedy at the heart of Nazism itself. At the very beginning of the film, we open with a shot of day, showing us what you would call the ideal German family, enjoying a nice outing by the side of a lovely river. This is the dream that formed the basis of the promise given by Hitler to Aryan Nazi families who previously lived under conditions of hyperinflation and unstable governments of the Weimar Republic before the Third Reich took over. As Gilles Deleuze explains in The Thousand Plateaus, in the modern state apparatus, desires and beliefs are the main flows running through society thanks to which the difference between social and individual ceases to exist. When Hedwig is handed out clothes obtained from the prisoners of the nearby camps, she distributes the cheap ones to her servants and tries on the fur jacket for herself. Later, she also reveals to her friends that she found a jewel in the toothpaste taken away from the prisoners. Through such desires, Hedwig embodies the Nazi belief of claiming back everything that was supposedly stolen from them by the Jewish people. So in this way, her behavior turns out to be a microcosm, a flow that acts as a resonance to the state apparatus. Similarly, the flowers that Hedwig is shown to be so proud of is just another desire that mirrors Nazi beliefs. As we can see Haas reference how often SS soldiers pluck flowers from the garden and how Hedwig herself routinely sends them to impress Haas's boss, presumably Himmler or Hitler. Through these flows, Hedwig believes that she is part of a great Nazi family. <laughs> With healthy, happy children who we see perform elements of the grown-up Nazi life as they play with baby cars, swim in the garden pool and enjoy music just like the Volkswagens and the lavish vacations at Prora promise to them in the future. According to Deleuze, these molecular flows inside the confines of a household indicate to us the creation of a mass movement. It's like the state apparatus taking over the semiotic regime of the house. In such a situation, the face of the father, mother, colonel and boss enter into redundancy and is replaced by a macro face, which in this case is the face of Hitler as we notice it being framed on the wall of Haas's room. The symbols of the skull, Nazi cross and the Hitler salute become the most distinguished parts of the environment. With time, however, as observers to these people, we also start to experience a sinister development in these very flows. When the German day turns to night, things beneath the surface begin to reveal themselves. We start noticing that the kids who are touted as healthy and happy don't really sleep at night. In a house where only material possessions of the Jews can be seen distributed in the day, the disturbing remnants of their teeth are inspected on the beds of the boys at night. When Horse goes around the house, turning off all its lights, he notices his daughter wandering in the middle of the night revealing a disturbed psyche. In another instance, Hedwig shows her mother the house in the day 
and she is tremendously impressed by her but when night eventually strikes her mother is horrified to see the burning in concentration camps happening right next door it's almost like the subconscious takes over and shows us darker elements hidden beneath the household's desires and beliefs while rudolf narrates nazified versions of fables to his daughters to put them to sleep glazer uses infrared cameras to invert the darkness of night and show us how at the same time some other girl is trying to feed the emaciated prisoners of the camp by placing apples at strategic locations and once this darkness makes itself clear in the day the family reaches a point of no return on one of the following mornings when horse goes canoeing and swimming with his children he realizes that remains from the camp have flown into the stream of the river and is visibly disturbed by this because the hidden truth is now creeping into their guarded flows in daylight the camps are kept hidden from our gaze but at the same time the children eventually overhear how a prisoner is beaten up for eating an apple that we know was implanted at night this uncovering of the reality underneath the house's micropolitics builds up to the most terrible irony in the scope of the film towards the end we cut to a shot in the morning where a man is dropping ashes into the soil of hedwig's garden In hindsight this reveals to us that the flowers we saw close ups of the ones that were meant to symbolize life actually grew out of the death of millions of people from the concentration camps this shows how the dreams of the nazi family happened to stem from the nightmares of the victims in the camps Once we get more clarity on what's really going on we also witness a disintegration of the ideal family touted to us in the beginning first the patriarch is transferred away from Auschwitz to Oranienburg as Hedwig ironically refuses to leave the house for her husband then her mother runs away as she realizes how horrific the situation at the camps is eventually winter comes in with the daughter stranded inside the house while the big brother traps his little brother inside their greenhouse a stark contrast to the party scene we saw earlier and an ironic takeover of the nazi war machine on the lives of the people this makes us cut to rudolf's life inside the nazi state where the discussions are mostly about the military industrial complex and that is when we get to realize with clarity what nazism truly means when rudolf attends a nazi party in budapest the only thing on his mind is how to burn people inside a room i want to pause the frame here in the middle of this stark irony because this is where i can show how the film reveals a bigger point about hitler that delius happens to make Delius remarks that the dangerous thing about power and fascism is precisely how important it is on a molecular level Hedwig feels that with the power to threaten her maids usurp Jewish possessions and set up her gardens her future is secured a future where her family can settle and farm after the war continuing the flows of ideal family life but in these very beliefs and desires also lies her tragedy she fails to realize how her complacency and values were part of a war machine responsible for destroying not only the lives of other people but also her own in the words of a nazi speech as documented in mephisto a novel by klaus mann in reality we are not marching forward we are reeling staggering our beloved führer is dragging us towards the shades of darkness and everlasting nothingness this is the central irony of nazism as seen in the film the same führer who once promised german families that he was their beacon of hope for a better life turns out to be the same man who takes his own life as he commands his fellow countrymen to destroy germany in telegram 71 if the war is lost may the nation perish In hindsight the gradual taking over of the deafening sound of destruction in the film also reminds us that the Nazi fascist government spent more money on war and death in the background than it did on the development of the German family in the foreground as a result men like Haus and his family are driven deeper and deeper into death constituting in the words of Delius a shift from means of production to means of destruction it is for this reason that the zone of interest exposes the shallowness of 
of National Socialism. This look into the micro politics of Rudolph's household reveals the tragic takeover of a suicidal state over the lives of impressionable children tricked by the walls they lived inside.